Hey there, veterans. This is Justin with a quick note before today's show. I've put together a few free ebooks that serve as a quantitative complement to these qualitative interviews. So if that's how your brain works, head over to the resources tab at beyondtheuniform.io and check them out. Hope that helps and enjoy the show. Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and each week I interview military veterans about their civilian career. Today's episode number 56 with Steve Ryan. Well, frankly, uh, it was never anticipated. I, I certainly never expected to be the, um, the head of, of PepsiCo, and uh, that was not my aspiration. And I, I say that because I think it's important for, um, for people to uh, take positions and work in places that they really enjoy what they're doing, not that they're doing something in order to just be prepared for the big job sometime down the road. Because the problem with that is that, first of all, you won't enjoy it. And secondly, if you're not happy in doing it, likely that the people around you aren't going to be happy with you doing it either. (laughs) And therefore, you probably never will get to the top position. Normally, I give you the top three reasons to listen to the episode. We're not doing that today. Here is Steve's bio, and I'm sure you'll agree that any veteran and non-veteran could learn something from today's episode. Steve was CEO of Pepsi from 2001 to 2006. During that time, revenue grew by $9 billion, net income rose 70%, earnings per share went up 80%, and PepsiCo's market cap exceeded $100 billion. Steve started out at the Naval Academy, after which he served for five years as an officer in the Marine Corps. After the military, Steve joined IBM as a sales rep and then earned his MBA at the Darden School of Business. After business school, Steve joined the Marriott, Roy Rogers Division, before moving on to PepsiCo's Pizza Hut Division, where after two years, he became president and CEO of Pizza Hut. During his time as CEO, he introduced home delivery as a distribution method overtaking market share of rival Domino's Pizza within two years. Steven then moved on to PepsiCo's Frito-Lay division as president and CEO, and then was promoted to PepsiCo's president and COO before being named to the CEO position two years later. After his tenure as Pepsi's CEO, Steve served as the dean of the Callaway School of Business and Accountancy and Babbitt Graduate School of Management at Wake Forest University for six years. Stephen has served on multiple boards, including the ExxonMobil Corporation, Marriott International, Walmart, American Express, Johnson & Johnson, Chick-fil-A, the United States Naval Academy Foundation, and the Salvation Army. As always, at beyondtheuniform.io, you'll find other great episodes, as well as the show notes for this episode. So with that, let's dive in to my interview with Steve Reinemann. Well, joining me today in Denver, Colorado, is Steve Reinemann. Steve, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Great to be with you. Thank you, Justin. So, Steve, the, the first thing that I wanted to dive into is, um, at what point did you know you were going to leave the Marine Corps, and how did you approach that decision? Well, it was a tough one. Um, I really hadn't uh, had plans uh, to, to get out. Um, until probably a year before my uh, commitment was up. And uh, it coincided with uh, meeting my uh, now wife of uh, 42 years when we first met in uh, D.C. and and, uh, started dating. Uh, I started to think about uh, what the future might look like and assignments and where I might be and um, we just made the decision to, to get out at that point, but it really wasn't. In, I was probably three and a half years into my commission. Loved the assignments, had great assignments, still wonderful memories of those years, and um, it was not an easy decision. And you went straight from the military into IBM as a sales rep. What what led you to that first initial job? Well, I think like many other uh, uh military uh, officers in situations like mine, I really didn't have any experience in business whatsoever. Didn't grow up in a business family, um, had no exposure other than I did, you know, frontline jobs uh, through high school, but I didn't really understand business. So when I was uh, thinking about getting out, I made the decision I really wasn't going to start looking until um, 
until I finished my commitment, which which I did. And so I looked at a number of different places, and and IBM was uh, was a great opportunity, and probably accepted the position um, without completely understanding what the nature of uh, the job was. But it was certainly a great experience to be there for a year and met some wonderful people and worked for a great company. And during that time, I realized that um, I really didn't know enough about business to be able to compete uh, in in sort of achieve the sort of uh, positions that I was interested in. So I decided that, you know, after a year to to go back to business school. And, and uh, so I went full time to the University of Virginia and got my MBA. And so uh, that that first year with IBM was a good introduction, but but it really wasn't, in my opinion at the time, uh, enough preparation. So that's what I decided to do. And and at the time, what were some of the common career paths that you saw other veterans taking? I, I'm wondering if, if business school at that time was a very popular option or, or what some of the tracks were that you thought were available. Well, I think it was probably more of a popular option then than it is now as a permanent, you know, as a full-time student. Uh, the MBA, the, the popularity of the MBA was growing at the time. It was not a mature market like the MBA market is today. And it really qualified you for a different uh, set of jobs um, than coming straight out did. And to answer your question about what most military people coming out did at the time, um, sales was a, was a popular um, item, and um, that's you know sales, sales related, uh, frontline type positions were the ones that were the most uh, common at that point. I think that's changed over the years. And frankly, today, uh, I think military officers coming out into the workforce or get a, a much stronger uh, reputation and much stronger opportunities. And they're broader than I think they were back in those days. And and I had read in a Bloomberg interview with you that it, it sounds like when you were at Darden, you decided fairly early on that you wanted to pursue a career in general management. And I was just curious what attracted you to that general management type role rather than a more specific functional expertise? Yeah, it's really a great question. And when I'm counseling students when I was at Wake Forest, I oftentimes uh, counseled them to uh, try to get what I would call is a hip pocket skill or a functional uh, specialty that you could carry with you through your career, your career, even if you didn't stay in that function forever. But I didn't do that myself. And uh, so I uh, sort of followed the path of taking positions similar to what I had experienced, uh, frankly, in the military. And I don't think I articulated it as well in those early years as I do today, but my um, passion has been probably as far back in my life as I can remember is to um, organize teams to take on missions that people think are difficult or impossible and to achieve them together as a team and to develop people in the process. And that's what I really enjoyed doing in the military. And uh, that's pretty much what I've done most of my professional career. And that's what led me to get into general management so that I actually was leading. I led teams from basically the time I left graduate school. They were small and I entered in the restaurant business. And after an orientation period of you know, sort of learning all the frontline positions, Bill Marriott, who hired me, wanted uh, to bring people in, start them at the bottom, give them a chance to run businesses and, and prepare them for senior management. So I started out. As a you know, learning the hourly positions in a fast food restaurant, had an assistant manager position, then a manager position, and you know, a manager in a restaurant is a general manager, but it's just, you know, it's a small operation, but you're totally in, in charge. And I really enjoyed that. I didn't expect to be a restaurant manager my whole life, but I have to look back and say that those were great days. I really enjoyed going to work um, and pulling the team together and and uh, serving our customers and. Then I had four restaurants as a district manager, and then I had 25 as a regional manager, and um, then I moved up into a chief operating officer, and 
was lucky enough with some uh, acquisitions we made that I became the general manager, uh, vice president, general manager of the division, uh, running all of the fast food restaurants for for uh, Marriott. So, really started out my career, uh, you know, without specific functional uh, knowledge or, or development, and uh, that's pretty much what I did the rest of my career. And and what what drew you? Because uh, up until your time at Wake Forest, it seems like you did have this emph- emphasis on restaurants and on the food industry, food and beverage industry. I, I'm wondering, was that a specific choice, or was it because there was a, this inaugural program at Marriott that you initially found yourself in that industry and then kind of continued in it? It's a great question, Justin. And you know, as you look back, it's hard to actually answer that. It wasn't uh, it wasn't as conscious a decision as um, as it might look today, and as is true for most people's careers. And, and uh, you know, I, I certainly know that there are people who plan out their careers very methodically and follow that track. But most of my friends and fellow CEOs, uh, I think we would admit that our paths were were uh, not as as meticulously conceived as they were opportunistically presented and and uh, so my movement from restaurants, which I really enjoyed, into um, the consumer product business when I ran Frito-Lay, that was only made available because PepsiCo owned both restaurants as well as um, Frito-Lay and Pepsi-Cola. Had I not been with Pepsi, I probably wouldn't have had the chance to, to um, you know, lead a business like Frito-Lay. So, you know, my advice to to young people thinking about their careers is don't overthink it because it's likely not to turn out the way you, uh, you might expect it to. That's, uh, that's great to hear. I mean, one of the things, so, so in a little bit, we'll get to some of the questions that some of our listeners sent to me when I told them I was going to be interviewing you. And that was one of the common questions was just, and, and I shared this as well, was wondering at the point at which you thought, man, I could be CEO of a Fortune 100 company. And I, I think that there's this general sense of wonder of if, if that was always this goal or if it was kind of just one thing was leading to another. And then before you know that, with that you were there. And I, I was just curious, like, at what point did you think, man, I could, I could go all the way to the top of this amazing and, and enormous organization? Well, frankly, uh, it was never anticipated. I, I certainly never expected to be the, um, the head of, of PepsiCo, and uh, that was not my aspiration. And I, I say that because I think it's important for um, for people to uh, take positions and work in places that they really enjoy what they're doing, not that they're doing something in order to just be prepared for the big job sometime down the road. Because I, the problem with that is that, first of all, you won't enjoy it. And secondly, if you're not happy in doing it, likely that the people around you aren't going to be happy with you doing it either. And, you, and therefore, you probably never will get to, um, you know, the, the top position. So in my case, um, certainly in my days in the restaurants, because restaurants were not the primary business of PepsiCo, there was, I think, highly unlikely that I would have ever become CEO of the company. And that was never my expectation. And when I moved to Frito-Lay, although Frito was the largest piece of the PepsiCo business, I never uh, expected to be CEO of PepsiCo. And I was quite pleased and happy to to have the opportunity to to run Frito and would have been happy to do that for, uh, you know, the extent of my career. But things happen and people you know, move and change and life has its, uh, you know, its strange way of presenting opportunities. And frankly, in my case, uh, you know, my mentor for 10 years, who was just a fabulous uh, leader that I learned so much from, got cancer and, uh, and, and passed away and had he lived, uh, you know, his com- complete career you know, the likelihood of of my becoming CEO would probably be far less. So it's just hard to to think about the, in a large company, um, you know, the 
sort of planning out your career so meticulously that, you know, that you have one goal in mind. And, and I would strongly encourage people not to, to think in those terms. And, and frankly, I'd say most of my peer friends, CEOs, had similar situations. Things happen, opportunities come up, uh, businesses do well, you're at the right place at the right time, and, and those kind of things happen. And many very qualified people that could very well be CEOs don't become CEOs for reasons that have nothing to do with their capability. That's great. I mean, I think for some reason that's so comforting to think that it was just, it, it sounds like it was just an experience of trying to do your best in every role you had and, and trying to be present with that and enjoy it and, and just be a, a good leader. And that that ended up leading to good things for you, but it wasn't this heavily orchestrated plan of, of trying to get from A to B. No, I never had that in my, in my career. And, and, um, you know, when I left the military, I certainly didn't have a, a, a specific plan. And, uh, I'd say that was pretty much the, the, uh, the way I operated the rest of my career. And even when I retired, um, I retired from, PepsiCo at an age younger than I had planned originally to retire because of some family uh, reasons. And, and uh, when I did, and my move to academia was certainly not something that I had planned either, but it was an opportunity that came available and I did it and it was a very gratifying experience. But again, it wasn't something that I had ever expected uh, to do. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask about is I, I really enjoyed the last lecture that you gave at Wake Forest. And for listeners, I'll add that in the show notes, a link to that video. It's, it's definitely worth watching. But, but you talked about this defining experience you faced back in 1986 when you first became CEO of Pizza Hut. And I, I believe at the time you were just 38 years old. You were three months into being CEO and, and you had this, um, this challenge. And I'm wondering if you could share that that story and what you learned from it? Well, it was one of the great defining moments of my, uh, of my career. And I, I uh, oftentimes talk about the, the failures of um, life and I put them in three categories, business, personal, and cultural. And uh, in 1986, I was faced with a, a pretty severe business challenge that was not going well. We were trying to move our business uh, as a pizza restaurant company, Pizza Hut, to becoming a delivery uh, and restaurant company, which doesn't sound like a big uh, change, but it, it is a big change in a number of ways. And we had a formidable competitor that had a head start on us at that time, which was uh, Domino's. We were much bigger than they were overall but they had uh, taken a leadership position in the delivery business. And that's where all the growth in the industry was going. So we made the decision to get into it. And, uh, you know, I was responsible for a plan that was put together that, that totally failed. We had four uh, planks to the, to the uh, strategy and, uh, you know, <laughs> all four of them were, were flawed. And as a result, we, we at one point were losing a million dollars a month which for our business at the time was quite a bit of money on a plan that really was never going to succeed. And so we had to sort of take a time out. And I was very fortunate to work for a leader who recognized our vision was right, but our plan was wrong. And when I went to him and ex expressed him that, that uh, it wasn't working and he agreed, uh, he was patient enough for us to come up with a, um, with a plan that did work and we put it in place and within uh, 12 months and certainly within 18 months, everyone else could see that this worked and we ended up moving into the number one delivery position in the country in the U S at the time with a different plan. But it was a very defining moment for me. Um, first of all, I was lucky to work for a boss and for a company that allowed you to fail. Um, but I learned the patient, the requirement for patience in innovation. And uh, how, you know, oftentimes, and I've seen it many times since then, 
that, you know, the initial ideas may be right, but the plans just don't work. And if your vision's right and your leadership is uh, in place, you can, you know, you can recover from that. So that was my primary lesson, but there were, there were, you know, I learned a lesson from each one of those strategic ideas that didn't work. And they, um, those lessons carried through, um, in fact, they still carry through today as I think about businesses, both in terms of investing and on the positions on the boards that I'm on. I think about these 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 leadership lessons like um, when you're testing something, test it um, an inch wide and a mile deep instead of a mile wide and an inch deep. And once you have your model corrected, you can roll it out fast. But if your model is is uh, weak, it's very difficult to succeed. So that was you know, one of the key lessons that I learned. I learned not to get ahead of your technology. At the time, we decided we were going to roll out with a 1-800 number, which sounds like a pretty simple technology today, but in 1986, it really wasn't um, as easy because we had all these units that were producing the pizzas that were connected to this 800 number and to make a long story short, it's just basically the technology. We were ahead of our skis, and I learned you really, you really have to make sure that you use technology properly, take your risks, but not embedding the farm uh, on on those types of leading edge or bleeding edge technologies. And pricing, we we overpriced our product in order to get the margins right, and didn't listen to the consumer and. Uh, we that was an expensive lesson to learn. So those are the kind of things that I learned in that early piece. But the major takeaway was that innovation, true innovation, transformation of a business is difficult. It often doesn't work on the first track. But um, growth and innovation and transformation are critical for successful businesses. And you, you have to drive for change. And incremental growth seldom ever uh, sustains a business long term. I mean, I love the, the candor on that, and I love that sense of, of how these failures have shaped how you interact with companies today. And I, I really enjoyed that in your last lecture as well, this sense that um, of commitment and how these train wrecks really help us evaluate our grit and, and how that's a great way to learn. And, and it's uh, you know certainly painful, and I imagine a lot of this was, was publicly embarrassing as you're leading this team and you've got a lot of pressure to grow, but it's, it's encouraging to hear how these failures and these mistakes you learned from, and that made, seems to have made such a big difference in your overall trajectory and the value you're still able to provide in businesses today of, of just having made these mistakes firsthand. You know, it's so counterintuitive to uh, Justin that, you know, oftentimes we think about our careers and we uh, and I certainly, you know, maybe not so much after that, but before that, I used to think about, you know, the the risks of uh, of, of taking um, new initiatives, and and uh, the the reality of it is that you never would wish for the failure that you get, and that failure was something I would never never have wished for, but I would say it was more than a defining moment for. For me and for the company and for all of the, us who were part of that management team who went on to do other things because we we redefined in our own minds what was achievable and possible and and we really all of us came away from that experience saying incrementalism just isn't the way to grow and there is risk with major change in innovation but it's really really important but the other piece that i think came out of it i'll i'll never know why um wayne calloway who was my boss who was chairman of the board of PepsiCo at the time I was running Pizza why he gave me the opportunity of Frito-Lay or why the board gave me the opportunity to run PepsiCo. I've never asked that. Uh, I always wanted to ask Wayne, but unfortunately I, he passed away and I never really got to, to ask him why he did that. But I would suspect that the failure in being able to rally a team to recover from the failure probably had something to do with my ability or my um, uh, opportunities that came after that. And I'd like to say that was the only failure I ever had and I never had more, but that's not true. I had several others uh, that through all the, the failures that we have, the, the, the lessons we learn are important. And also the idea that 
just motoring through and getting the digging deep to um, uh, to, to provide the the leadership to to the team to get through that is is really important, and that's the testing that we as leaders get. And frankly, for most of us, it started with that similar kind of testing that we got in the military. And uh, and I think that, you know, when I look for people to um, promote or select or recommend, I always want to see how did they react to, um, to crisis, to failure, to difficulties. And uh, it's important to know that about a person because it's likely that if you put someone in a leadership position, they're probably going to be faced with that. And it's helpful to know how they've reacted to that kind of thing in the past. That's great. I mean, it seems like a theme that's come up uh, with people I've interviewed, in particular the the entrepreneurs of just how vital that tenacity is of just knowing that if you get knocked down a hundred times, you're going to get up 101, that every single time you get pushed over, you're able to, to, to like you said, dig deep, learn from it and, and come back and keep showing up. And, um, it's just, it's just very encouraging to hear that that has been your experience as well. Cause I, I think that sometimes I, at least I, 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 I sugarcoat a story like yours where it seems like, man, maybe, maybe he just had all of these breaks along the way or just, you know, played the perfect game and just never missed a hole, never missed a shot. And, and it sounds like instead your experience was facing just as much adversity, if not more than so many other people, but continuing to come back and continuing to learn and continuing to try. Well, and I think that's, that's really important. I, I know when I counsel students, uh, in the MBA program, I, one of my um, major messages is don't don't try to plan your career through um, you know riding the top of the waves and uh, you know not getting deep into the business and trying to avoid challenges and conflicts. It's you know uh, it's it's the difficult situations, many of them filled with obstacles that you know, present failure, frankly, those are the fun ones. Um, and also they're the ones that define uh, the, the characteristics of leadership that are so important through, um, you know, through developing and growing a business. And and I wanted to ask about the progression from Pizza Hut to Frito-Lay and then from Frito-Lay to, to PepsiCo CEO and, and in terms of how the job changed. And, and I think of this in terms of I got out of submarines when I was a division officer and I just remember – there were department heads that you could just tell they were exceptional division officers, and that skill set was the ability to just get things done and execute. But then when they moved on to department head, the game changed, and it was no longer about personal execution. It was about delegation and about managing a team and about being able to distribute workload. And there were some department heads that just didn't make that shift well, that they were exceptional as division officers, but when the game changed, they weren't able to change with it. And, and I was curious, um, how, how did the game change when you went from Pizza Hut to Frito-Lay? And then again, how did that, that layout shift again when you went from Frito-Lay to Pepsi? I'm just curious what skill sets were required that were very different as you took that step up each time? Well, contrary to what may seem obvious, the, the, the step from Pizza Hut to Frito was not... Um, nearly as difficult in terms of the nature of the job as it was from pizza, from uh, Frito to PepsiCo. And the reason for it is even though the businesses are dramatically different in consumer products, um, particularly Frito-Lay, which is a completely vertically integrated business from uh, you know, growing the seeds uh, to um, the farmers uh, growing the crops to the, uh, manufacturing of the product and the shipping of the product to the stores and actually putting the product on the shelf. I mean, it's a completely vertically integrated company, completely owned by PepsiCo. And, and um, I mean, we had the largest commercial fleet in the country at the time. So, I mean, it's a big operation and it's very different than the nature of a 
restaurant, but not as different as people as one would think, because going back to an earlier sort of conversation about what, um, you know, what you like to do, what an individual likes to do, that the, both jobs required the CEO to be the quarterback and you had functional experts surrounding you that you operated together as a team. And this, you know, the nature of the business was different. The functions were, had different responsibilities, but it was still basically a, a team effort that, uh, and that role of, of the CEO was, was the quarterback. Moving from Frito to PepsiCo was one that, frankly, I debated in my own mind quite a bit as to whether I could even do that job. And much like you talked about your department head, I knew that I had had up till that time, uh, you know, 25 years of of experience in being a quarterback uh, and really enjoyed it. I mean, that was what made me get up in the morning with excitement was, you know, defining the mission and, and raising the setting the goals and helping the team develop and grow and selecting people and helping them develop. And that part I really enjoyed moving from Frito to PepsiCo was really moving from quarterback to coach. And the skills are very different. And I wasn't sure that I had, that I could make that switch because one of the things about PepsiCo that I really appreciated. And one of the reasons I joined the company is that the division presidents, the general managers got to run their businesses. And um, Wayne Calloway was my boss for both at Frito-Lay and at Pizza Hut when he was chairman. And he was a fabulous boss. And he was a great coach. He could have won the Super Bowl in the pro- pro- coaching a professional football team. There's no question in my mind because he, he's just, he's, he's very technically competent, but he's a tremendous leader and motivator and doesn't try to do the work for you. And I wasn't sure I could actually make that change. And I thought about it for a while. I um, didn't actually accept the position the first time it was put out there because I just wasn't sure that that was what I could wanted to do, could do well, and would be successful in doing. And after thinking about it for a while, I decided I'd make a shot at it. But I knew I had to change my style. And I couldn't um, manage and lead the way I had for all the years before that I had to learn how to help other general managers, um, empower them and, and coach them, but not, you know, not direct the individual uh, efforts. So that was a huge change. And frankly, um, I admitted to the, my team then I went, did the job at PepsiCo that they need, I need their help to make sure that I could actually perform the, the way it needed to be done. And, and, as uh, you know, so we had some interesting discussions about that from time to time because I, I'm sure I wasn't um, perfect at at that kind of delegation, but it you know it did work out, and I loved that position, and it was it was a completely different kind of experience, but one that um, I'd say that I don't think I had a job anywhere in my career that was as gratifying as being you know the CEO of PepsiCo, but it certainly wasn't what I had ever prepared myself to do. I admire so much about that, this willingness to, to get out of your comfort zone and, and really stretch in a role that you knew would be very demanding. And and one of the things I wanted to ask about is related to how you prepared for that role. When, when you were saying, you know, you weren't sure if you had the abilities or you knew you needed to shift your leadership. And, and I wanted to ask specifically about um, mentorship or anything else that helped you grow into that role. And, and I just know that even leading a small startup as CEO, it's, it's very lonely and it's very difficult to get that feedback and coaching that I've had in other roles. And it's caused me to have a lot of empathy for any commanding officer I ever served under and kind of reviewing that role and thinking, man, if you're CEO of a ship or of a unit, it's such an isolating location and it's so difficult to get that mentorship to, to excel and to expand and continue to develop. And so I'm wondering when you were at the helm of PepsiCo, how did you seek out mentorship and how did you get feedback on areas in which to grow? 
Well, that's a really good question. I, I, I don't, I never thought of the job as being a lonely job, frankly. Um, I did think about the importance of getting feedback and getting, you know, developing, and there's many different ways of, of doing it. Certainly um, creating an environment as best you can where your, uh, your team will actually give you feedback uh, is important. And if you have strong leaders in those positions, they will, and they did for me. And it wasn't always easy to hear, and it wasn't always, um, I'm sure I wasn't always uh, uh, receptive to it, but certainly the team feedback was important. Uh, the board is, uh, you know, I, I had a fabulous board of directors and got tremendous both collective and individual uh, coaching from from them, both uh, mostly when I asked for it, but, um, you know, sometimes it it came even when I didn't ask for it, but um, that is another source. But one that I really enjoyed was uh, shortly after I got into the position, um, I realized that there were several of us in the same geographic area of uh, Westchester County, New York City area that were uh, had similar backgrounds. We all, several of us came into our roles having had a long career at the company, taking over successful companies from charismatic predecessors we had in common. So there were, there were four of us that sort of formed this quarterly CEO group and we'd have dinner together. We'd rotate around at different places. And, um, and it was uh, Sam Palmazano who was had recently taken over as CEO of IBM and Ken Chenault who had recently taken over uh, American Express and Jeff Immelt who had recently taken over GE and we all became CEOs within six months of each other. And um, we had had then and still do have a friendship. Uh, I don't get together with them in the same way because, um, you know, Jeff and Ken are still in the job and Sam and I are both retired, but we still see each other and socially and serve on boards together and so forth. But that was really helpful because we weren't in competing industries and we had similar problems and challenges and we could sit around and talk about them. We trusted each other to to uh, keep the confidences when we did that. So those were some of the areas. And then the last one I'd offer is uh, something I suggest a lot to students, and that is to have a personal board of directors, people who you have close personal relationships with and in many cases have had it for a long time, who are willing to hold you accountable for what you say you want to do. And... Um, in my case, uh, you know, the chairman of that group was my wife, who uh, been married for 42 years, and she's not bashful in giving me advice and keep holding me accountable. And and uh, there were several other important people in my life who have served in that role. And I think that whole concept of a personal board of directors is is really really important. And not to belabor this question, but I'll just end with my point of view from having watched many leaders over my career now that I'm at an age where I can look back and say, you know, that I've certainly seen a lot. Uh, and in my own challenges, I think the biggest single area that leaders need to really be thoughtful about, and that is their own personal conduct and their own personal character and their, their own accountability. Because the biggest failures and the ones that are the most costly to the companies, to the families, to the associates of the companies are personal failures that are um, often brought around by leaders who who lose accountability and lose perspective. And it's oftentimes not technical competence. It's more moral and character competence and uh, execution that causes the problems. So long-winded answer to your question. No, that's great. And I, and I appreciate it as well. In that last lecture, your, your comments on character and this, this moral compass that, that guides you. And, and maybe this relates to the next question. Cause I, I wanted to ask, uh, kind of three aspects of, of, about leadership. And I, I was curious, um, what leadership trait that you learned in the military that you tried to retain in your civilian career and, and strengthened you 
But then second, if there was any, anything in, in terms of leadership that you learned in the military that you actually feel like you had to change when you got out, that you actually had to let go of and, and modify to succeed. And then lastly, if there was any leadership trait that you developed after the military that was really critical to, to your success in your civilian career. Well, there's a lot in that question, a series of questions, but I would start off by saying I don't think that in my own experience, both reflecting uh, back uh, in my own background and thinking about it in today's context, I don't think there's any difference in the basic, the, the most basic characteristics of leadership in the military or in the civilian world. I think they're, they're, they're just almost identical. Um, the crucible of testing those characteristics are are sometimes different, but the characteristics them, themselves are the same. And people sometimes think of them different because they have the false understanding that, say, for instance, in the military, you just order people to do things and they get them done. That's no more true in the military than it is in civilian life. It just doesn't work that way. People don't respond. Now, in combat, that may be a different situation but it really isn't because in the end of the day, if, if um, teams are well-trained and there's a good communication and a good respect, then the relationships and the decisions and the way they're carried out are very, very much the same. And so I think the part of your question is how do you develop as a leader over time? I think whether you stay in the military or you get out, Certainly, as you grow, you have a different perspective on yourself and on life. But I don't think the most fundamental aspects of leadership are different. And for me, I saw these in the military, and I saw, I've seen them in the civilian world. One is what we just mentioned, character. And what is the moral compass? What is the What are the traits and habits that a leader has that is so important to be able to get others to, to follow. And we could go deep in that character, but I, for the sake of time, I won't. The second piece is competence and competence. Um, certainly in the military, you learn the importance of competence and you're provided with training and testing and, and technical uh, capabilities. And that's certainly important. The second part of competence is experience, and and um, you, you put the two things together. You take technical competence and capability and intellect, and you put it together with experience, and that's the picture of true competence. And I think it's so true in the military as well as it is in the civilian um, civilian world, and. Many mistakes that have been made in the last decade and the failures of business have been made. They've been characterized often by by failure in character, and sometimes that's true. But oftentimes they're failure in competence that ends up sometimes looking like character. So, for instance, if if a leader is not competent in accounting and understanding what's accepted in accounting, you can make huge errors that look like their character and maybe one one way of looking at it would be character, but really it's not having competence. And that's, it's extraordinarily important. The third uh, area is commitment and just being committed to um, the associates you work with, the mission of the organization, um, and the goals that you set and that sort of, we talked earlier about grit. It's that, that ability to get knocked down and get up. And it's the strength of character that is committed to a vision and, and getting it done. And then the fourth one is compassion. And that's really caring for the people around you. And some people think compassion is part of character and it is, but I think the whole area of, of people and um, having the focus on others is so important. It justifies being called out separately than just being a part of character. So those are the 
sort of four C's that I think about in leadership, character, commitment, compassion, um, and competence that are just critical in any aspect of, of a successful life. That's great. And, and one of the many reasons I was excited to connect was your, your most recent experience at Wake Forest and just kind of how you went from industry then to the front lines of, of education. And I, I'm wondering how the landscape has changed now, or or maybe put a different way, if you were starting all over again right now and you were just leaving the Marine Corps, is there any way in which you'd approach your career differently today than you did when you first started out? Um, good question. First of all, I don't spend a lot of time looking back. I, I don't know if that's a, a flaw, fault or not, but I, I don't, and I don't, you know, sort of second guess. Uh, so I haven't given a lot of time to that kind of that the nature of that question. And I, um, primarily cause I, I consciously try to look forward what, you know, what am I going to do next? Where am I going to make a difference? What's, you know, what am I called to do going forward and, and, you know, use the experiences of the past. So I, I don't really think I have much of a substantial, um, answer to your question, I'm sure on the edge, uh, there's things I would do, you know, I probably do differently, but not, you know, not significantly. So maybe I would have gone straight to business school instead of had a year detour at IBM, but I learned a lot at IBM and I met some great people. I worked for a tremendous organization. Um, it wasn't a fit for me in the sense of what I really wanted to do and the passion that I had, but but I wouldn't, you know, I don't regret it. So for what it's worth, I, I just, that's just who I am. I think everybody's different and you have to understand yourself to, yeah. to be able to, to be able to make decisions. But for me, looking back, it's just never been something that has been very fruitful. I think that's, no, I think that's great. And I think it's, it's probably one of those things too. If you're happy with where you're at right now, you realize everything, the good and the bad and the mistakes and everything together that all culminated in where you're at now. And you can't really pick and choose and, and, and remove or extract any of that. Um, and you know, one thing I wanted to touch on as well is, you know, the fact that you've been married for 42 years, that, that in many ways is, is even more of an accomplishment than everything you've done in your professional life. It's just so rare to hear that now. And for those who are listening, who are in a partnership, I'm just wondering if you have any advice on, um, what you've learned in 42 years of marriage and how, how to make that work and how to make that something that's, that's vibrant. Well, one of the questions that I get, I used to get often at, uh, when I was in the business school world, uh, recently, and I get it in the professional groups that I speak to as well. In fact, I spoke recently at, to a Harvard uh, class of middle managers, and this we spent most of our time together talking about this subject. It has to do with balance, and I think it is a struggle that every leader has about the balance that you have in your life. And I don't have a silver bullet answer, but I think it's something that is it's important to think about and it's important to have defined boundaries that you have developed for your life and consciously thought about. Don't often live up to them, but you at least have defined them. And uh, in my case, uh, I, I think about it like a pendulum and a clock. Then if you think about the pendulum passing through the center point for a fleeting moment as it goes back and forth from one side to the other, that's sort of the way I think of balance in my life. I think there are fleeting moments when I'm totally balanced, but they don't last very long. To me, the, the, the secret in that is one, to have your purpose in life well understood so that you can calibrate the, the, this balance. And then secondly, what does that really mean? And to me, it, I visualize it like keeping the pendulum or the arc of the pendulum in a defined space and not going from, you know, one end to the other. And probably many people that are going to listen to this have never watched the pendulum at a clock because that's sort of an old thing. But in the old days, if you had a pendulum clock and it went, the, the, the arc went too far, the pendulum, the, the, the uh, weight 
uh, fell off. Remember, I had a cuckoo clock, and that's what used to happen. If the arc got too wide, the thing would just fall off. And that's what life is like. If you get that arc too wide, um, it, it's just your life's not going to work. What does that mean? Just to bring it down to a graphical example, um, I used to oftentimes run into people who say, well, you know, I, you know, I, I have balance in my life. I, you know, I'll go off for two or three weeks and, and, you know, be away from home and then I'll be home for the weekend. Well, that may work for some people, but it doesn't work very often for families because kids aren't going to wait until you're home for two days to save up all the things they want to talk to you about and the times they want to be with you and the games they have. You have to sort of be there in the moment or you're, you've missed it. So defining that pendulum is with your significant other and with your kids, if that if they're in the picture and with you know parents is really an important piece and in my way of thinking it's you know on a day-to-day basis it may not always be perfect but if it's not working on a week and then a month and then a six month and then a year basis it's probably a problem and uh, so I think that idea of, of developing the appropriate balance for your life is is something worthy of of someone's time and and um, and thought. Mm, that's great. Um, well, there's a, a hundred other questions I could ask, but I I know we're short on time, and I always like to leave the last question just to turn the tables. And I, I know that I've asked a lot of questions, but knowing that you have an audience of people on active duty and and other veterans who have transitioned already to the civilian. Uh, their civilian career. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you'd want to share with them advice on personal life or professional life or, or anything we haven't covered? Well, I'd start by saying um, for the people that are listening who have served and who are serving, I thank you for your service to our country and for your willingness to, to do that. And, and my hope is that in that service, you've learned and benefited from it, and I suspect you've benefited a lot more than you think you have. And uh, I, this goes back as long as I can remember. I think most of us in the military underestimate the value that we bring to the civilian world, either while we're in the military, serving in our communities, or after we get out. And I'll never forget when I made the decision to get out and went to my commanding officer. Uh, tremendous leader, wonderful person who went on to be a three-star general. But he was really, uh, I think, convinced that that a military background that you you know you're just not going to survive and succeed in the civilian world, and that's just not true. And it's certainly not true today. It's your service is more valuable to your potential future opportunities in the in the economy. Than they've ever been. When I got out during the Vietnam era, that we were sort of in a downturn of how people thought about military service. But clearly now, the service uh, to our country is valued, and companies are looking for great leaders that can come in and bring this servant leadership, the the um, kind of um, care for for people that military leaders have been developed to do. So my message, my single message would be, you're a lot more valuable, a lot better, a lot more capable than you probably think you are, and don't ever lose confidence. That's great, Steve. Well, I I appreciate your taking the time to speak with me, and um, I just appreciate all the words of wisdom and, and just also the example that you are to a lot of veterans who aspire to that pinnacle of leadership in the civilian sector. So thank you for, uh, for the work that you've done, and thank you for your time today. Great. Take care, Justin. I've I've enjoyed it. Surface, surface, surface. Thanks for listening. Before you go, three important announcements. First, if you believe in what I'm doing and believe in supporting veterans in their careers, please, please, please help me spread the word. The best way I know to do that right now is by taking 18 seconds to write a review on iTunes. It would mean a lot. Second, 
Based on my interviews, I'd advise any and all veterans to look at servicetoschool.org and the American Corporate Partners. Both are completely free for veterans and give you a lot of great resources for your education or professional life, respectively. Third, there are a ton of other great interviews, resources, and data at beyondtheuniform.io. Check it out, share it with your friends, and drop me a line if you have any feedback because I'd love to hear from you. Thanks, and see you on the next interview.